guys, we're going to get started here. Uh, welcome to the first session here for NatP in this room, which is full of a lot of really interesting digital-oriented content as the next couple days go on. Uh, this is the great unbundling, which you see right up there, surviving and thriving during the upcoming IPTV upheaval. One of those titles meant to uh, be a little bit provocative, and hopefully the session will be pr provocative as well. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff today designed to get everyone thinking about what this new world of digital delivery will look like, where it's going, and where we are. I'm Jim Lauterbach. I'm the CEO of an internet television network called Revision 3. We produce 27 shows and distribute them only digitally. We distribute everything from YouTube to Yahoo to apps that we build across everything from the smallest smartphone to the biggest smart TV. We fundamentally believe that every one of these glowing rectangles in your life will become, if it's not already, a television or a video display device. And we want to be on every single one of these glowing rectangles in the best capability that we can. So pull together an interesting panel here to talk about where we're going. And I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves, but I just want to talk for a minute about what I was looking for putting this together. So um, Nico here from, uh, from MSN and Bing, from Microsoft, represents uh, both a technology and a media company trying to figure out what this world looks like with a very large platform out there. Um, to his uh, immediate left, Jeremy Toman is building uh, applications to help people make sense of all this. Because yeah, you can put all your content out there in the digital sphere, but if nobody can find it, that didn't really, wasn't really very successful, was it? Uh, and then next to him, Colin and Mike, both at different levels, have been working on a virtual versions of cable TV bundles that would be delivered only via IP, not via cables that they own. And so they've got interesting perspectives on how that world's developing in the US and also internationally. So uh, interesting group of people, both on the content side, on the, uh, on the software delivery side, on the app side, and then on the, uh, what, we, what we're calling the MVPD, a virtual MVPD, which is, uh, I'm sure we'll describe what that is as we move down the path. So with that, I want to let each of these guys talk a little bit about who they are and what they're doing, and then we're going to jump into questions. You'll see a couple mics here. We're going to have time for a couple questions. Uh, feel free to ask them, but I don't want to get overwhelmed with questions. And if uh, you end up uh, not asking a question but start talking about your opinions, I'll cut you right off. So um, <laughs> the, uh, if your opinions are good, you can come up here and take one of these seats, and I'll leave. Uh, I'm good with that. So uh, Nico, go ahead. If anybody wants to come and take this seat, that's fine with me. <laughs> um, my name is Nico Charles. I manage uh, video programming for MSN and Bing Video. Uh, that includes many flavors of video, including original content, custom branded content, licensed content. Um, we are uh, we we are we are very very interested in in all aspects of how the, the IP TV world is developing uh, and are in many places gathering as much data as possible on those, uh, those uh, different platforms, different um, uh, consumer, consumer habits uh, to, to help inform what our, our ongoing strategy is going to be. Uh, as many of you might know, we recently launched a refresh of the Xbox Live experience, which includes um, video apps and, and ways to consume video on Xbox in a, a sort of new and unique way. Uh, that's a very, very new and recent um, launch that uh, we've had one, one month's worth of data from that is very promising. Uh, but this is an exciting time because everything is, is changing uh, from delivery methods to consumption patterns uh, to how we create content. And we don't necessarily have the answers, but we have, uh, um, have our fingers in a lot of places. Well, and it also creates a lot of opportunity and for people who are creating programming, new ways to get their programs funded and out there. And we'll be talking more about that as we go along. Jeremy, talk a little bit about what you guys are doing. Sure. So uh, I'm Jeremy Tillman. I've been in the future of TV space from the tech side for a while. I've been at startups in Silicon Valley, a company called Mediabolic, which is now part of Rovi Corp. Uh, I was originally at Sling Media. I helped launch Boxy, Clicker, and Voodoo, and a bunch of other companies in the space. And now I'm at Digit, where we kind of have Digit Today, which is a app of hundreds of thousands of users, as a, using it as a social TV guide and as a remote control. Uh, basically, you find out what your friends are watching, um, link that to the devices in your home, and through a few simple clicks, control what's going on in your living room. Where we're going is a very content social first view of the living room. So 
our general premise is that the entire concept of a remote control sucks. It's basically the device that gets in the way of you and your entertainment experience. We think consumers should be able to pick up any of those glowing rectangles, browse through the content that they want to watch, their friends want to watch, you guys want them to watch, and one click later, the devices turn themselves on, and as if by magic, the content they want just starts playing. That's kind of our vision of the living room, and, and so we want to sit in that center point. Thank you. Colin, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the things you've been doing and what you've been sure. learning. Sure. Uh, my name's Colin Decker. I'm the Chief uh, Programming and Product Officer working with the Virgin Group. Um, right now, uh, I've been working hard to develop uh, MVPD models over IP. Um, so this is, uh, this is sort of the... Can you define what an MVPD is? Sure. I threw that acronym out and probably everyone's like, what? Yeah, it's a multi-channel video programming distributor, and uh, I, I'm guessing probably half the people in the room know, know that. Um, the, uh, the, the challenges um, involved with that, um, particularly around live linear carriage and affiliate distribution. Um, so anybody in here who's ever done uh, carriage distribution will know how complicated and how difficult that, that can be. Uh, so that's been a big area of focus for me. My, my background is, is uh, really split between content. I've done a lot of television work. I was one of the founding team at Current TV. I ran video at Yahoo. I headed programming for a company uh, called Rooftop Media uh, that actually sold shows to both this gentleman and this gentleman. Um, so I've really been on both the content side of the equation as well as sort of the distribution and monetization side of the equation. So MVPD really meaning here in the U.S. taking ESPN, Stars, HBO, uh, A&E, Disney Channel, et cetera, bundling them all up into a service that you sell directly to consumers and deliver over the IP network, not over a cable infrastructure, right? Is that a good? That's a good description of what uh, a lot of people are thinking about doing and trying to do. Okay, so Mike, that's also what you're involved in, that's right? That's what I'm doing. I, I had a discussion. Um, <laughs> my name is Mike West. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Genos TV. We are about to become a virtual MP, MVPD. <laughs> I have to practice that one. Um, Basically, delivering uh, cable television, linear, and VOD stored content over IP networks um, into um, what is ultimately the you know the world's most ubiquitous connection, which is the internet, of course. Um, my background: I had uh, 28 years with IBM, working at everything from the tiniest transistor right the way up to large consumer multimedia systems. Um, you know, I still understand the guts of televisions. I'm very much a technologist. Uh, my only experience with content is creating PowerPoint slides, so uh, it, I'm a little bit more in the technology camp. Uh, but basically, what we're trying to do is very similar to what Colin was describing, which is essentially to create um, an MV, MVPD, I struggle with that, Jim, MVPD Sorry. that uh, basically can be delivered to anywhere on Earth with a decent broadband connection. Um, what we're focusing on is delivering um, linear content, we're in the late stages of getting carriage rights to pretty much all of the major TV programmers in the United States. Um, and ultimately, we'll deliver that service across North America and try to spread out across the world. Okay, so look, I want to have a conversation with you guys, and, and really we should converse around this rather than everyone talking uh, linearly, about what this new world looks like. And then we'll get into a little bit of what that opportunities are for people are creating programs in new places to sell it. But let's just start out with what that world looks like. Um, I, I, as we put the description together for this, it was fairly uh, incendiary. So everything's going IP and forget all the old ways of getting your con Is that really true? Do we see all video entertainment in the US and then worldwide going via IP, or is there still going to be a place for a long time for the existing uh, transport mechanisms? And Jeremy, I'm just going to start with you, but I want everyone to jump in and, and disagree with each other if you want to. Uh, when it comes to TV, I, I'm actually one of the believers that that's the area of technology that will change the slowest. Um, I think, uh, as I've talked to cable execs, the, the, the consistent statement kind of comes about the Super Bowl, interestingly, is that that doesn't really matter that everybody's watching most other things for 364 days. It seems like this, this, the whole discussion comes back about the Super Bowl is, until you can stream the Super Bowl, we're living in a broadcast world. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to, to hear how they think about it. I think obviously when you look at stats of Hulu, YouTube, Amazon, everybody, clearly there's a lot of other watching happening. But uh, from, I think from a cable first perspective, they see very broadcast. But don't you think people are going to an on-demand world where people want to watch it when they want to watch it? I mean, yeah, there are live things yes. that you're going to want to watch you know, when everyone else is watching, but most stuff you want to watch on your time, Mike. Jim, I mean, uh, yes, and for the technology generation, my kids, your kids, you even, 
you know, you're happy hunting around all sorts of sites, using his software or somebody else's software to find what you want, watching it anytime, everywhere, on every platform. But the majority of uh, video consumption, at least in the United States, and I believe around the world, is still basically a sit-back experience. I, I, the early definition of television for me was given to me by a cynic, and he said basically it's the light that casts no shadow. Right? So even as the light photons are flying towards your head, they simply go through it without uh, interacting. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very wow. passive, sorry, that was a highly technical thing. I explained photons offline. Um, but the, it, it, it's a very passive experience in a lot of ways. One thing that scares me about what we're doing now is we're starting to force people to hunt, right? Is TV really a search and hunt <coughs> experience yeah. for a lot of people? I mean, again, our generation, our kids' generation, yes, perhaps so. But uh, for a lot of technically savvy, uh, technically unsavvy people, it's not. I keep thinking of the guy um, somewhere down south, let's say, with a six-pack or a beer from a six-pack in one hand and a remote control in the other. Right? That's a sizable piece of the uh, population. You know what, Nico? You guys have the these Trojan horses in 30 million households in the U.S. <laughs> and other places called the Xbox and MSN, which uh, people are going up to, and you're increasingly buying content and creating content just for that platform. Do you buy this, that I just want to sit back with my beer and my remote and watch my TV? I'm falling out of my chair. Right. <laughs> <laughs> While well, I reinsert um, myself here. All right, I, I, I have to address a couple go, of no, things. No, please, do. Earlier. Go, go. <laughs> That's why you're here. I never thought I'd be on a panel where the words light photons would be uh, yeah, right. uh, yeah, okay. in the conversation, so thank you. That's my pleasure. Um, MVPDs will not succeed unless they come up with a better acronym. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> You mentioned the Super Bowl, so I'm, I'm sorry, but go Patriots. Yes! Um, you guys be quiet. Um, <laughs> and then uh, to what you were saying about, about the, the sit-back experience, and I don't know if I'm necessarily agreeing or, or disagreeing, but, but what, what these things are doing um, that, that I think are, are fundamentally changing how we, we consume content is... People have, 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 have for a long time described uh, watching TV as a, as a sit-back experience mm -hmm. and then in, engaging with content online as a, as a lean-forward experience. And, and this is not my phrase or my term, but I can't remember who it's from, so uh, uh, attribution apologies to whoever came up with mm -hmm. this. Um, this and, and, and smartphones are, are neither of those. It's not, it's not lean back. It's not, uh, it's not lean forward. It's a curl up experience. Um, you know, you're on your sofa, you know, curled up and you're watching whatever and you're consuming, uh, you know, like this, like that. And, and it's, it's, it's just, it's a very different, uh, I think, cultural, social perspective in which to consume content that changes, that, that method of consumption changes how we um, sort of what frame of mind we're in while we're consuming that content, and by extension, the nature of the content uh, has to adapt to, to be optimized for that experience uh, itself. I don't know what that is. Um, I, I think it just means that, that to a certain extent, there's, there's a whole new window of, of content types or content forms uh, that, that are now available to us. Uh, we don't necessarily know what they are, but they're different mm -hmm. from what we've got. And, uh, and frankly, I think that's, that's exciting. It can have your So, so consumers right now, uh, I'm sorry, you know what, Colin, I'm going to let you hop in on this as well. Yeah, well, I, it's interesting because I think what Nico's saying is those are different services, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, from my perspective, I would look at that and say those are two different services. Um, you know, the, uh, I'd like to go back to what Mike brought up, which is, in, in my mind, is really a question about live linear television, right? And I, I'll, I'll throw an incendiary bomb. Are, we're in the Google Theater, I think, right now or something? Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks yeah. for bringing that up. Um, was it uh, Larry or somebody said, uh, this was months ago, they were in England, and, they, and they, I've read so many blog entries by folks at Google that have worked on TV or YouTube, and they're, they're always preceded by the statement, everybody knows that they want more control, more choice of what they want to watch on television. And then they proceed to sort of explain the great new feature or service or whatever it is they're going to do. And I, I think that, that when it comes to live linear television, and the, certainly in the lean back context, and I can say this knowingly from a position of having executed research around this, um, that's just absolutely dead wrong. Mm -hmm. 
nobody wants control. Nobody wants to search at all. I mean, even, I don't think Siri's the answer. I don't think, I think the vast majority of people want to just hit one button and Joe Sixpack yeah. wants to get down yeah. to business with his beer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, but that's a different bit, that's a different, um, it's a different service, I think, than, well, than what we do. Jeremy, just jump just in, not to look at me, just jump in. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I, I want to kind of blend some of the comments here. I think taking the curl up comments, I like the term, by the way, I think I everyone here is probably going to agree that there is this new thing called what you do on your iPad and iPhones. What I would suggest is that, that it's, it's really its own topic. You can't really compare the what I'm going to do in bed with my 10-inch iPad versus in my living room couch with a 63-inch connected TV. And I think those are just radically different experiences. Um, I've taken a step back to look at things, and I, I've been lean forward, lean back mantras for over a decade now. And now I've actually introduced a new term in my own vernacular. It's not a new term. It's the second screen. Um, I think we need to look at the second screen as a corollary experience to all other experiences. And that's the, I'm browsing through content libraries, and I want to watch it on blank. And that might be the curl up mode, it might be the, the lean back mode, et cetera. Um, but I do think there's a combination of what you guys said. I, I do I, think I, I you want to search where I think search to me is find something off my DVR, find something off VOD, find something off OTT, find mm -hmm. something on YouTube, Bing, et cetera. Or there's browse, which is turn on the TV, channel up, channel right. up, yep. channel up. Yep. Yep. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, services and money. Because in the end, that's how we're all going to get paid for our content if somebody pays us money to create that content or to view it. And 10 years ago, it was satellite and cable, and that was it. You spent a whole pot of money, and you got a whole pot of channels, and that was it. And then, then we had Netflix, and we started paying a little bit, a little pot of money over here for Netflix to get additional video brought into our house. Um, and, then, and now it's, it's Hulu Plus, or it's Amazon Prime, or it's a new MVPD, or it's cable. I mean, who in the end, will consumers move to spending, having contractual video relationships with a handful of people, mm -hmm. with one or two, mm -hmm. with 10? I, I, I do think that what consumers want in that space is a la carte. Mm -hmm. Whether or not the market will conform to, to mm -hmm. supply them with that, yeah. uh, uh, time will tell. But I do think, speaking from my own experience, I would love to cut the cable, but I got to have me some Game of Thrones. Is that a la carte for channels or shows? you got to have Game of Thrones. You don't need HBO. You need a Game of Thrones. Right, right. I, I mean, right? you want to see what happens to that dragon down to the, you don't care about. Down, down to the granular, as granular a level as possible is what the consumer wants, um, what, but whether, uh, whether that'll that ever happen. Isn't that iTunes? Well, right? <laughs> I, can buy, I can buy, I'm on Entourage. I'm about to start, I think, season six. Yeah. It's $32 on, on iTunes. Uh, it, it, is, it is for content that isn't, um, uh, for th that isn't particularly timely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. I think for that flavor of content, that's fine. But, but for content that, that people need to have right now, mm -hmm. whether it's because the content requires it in, in the case of sports or, or news or, or topical uh, fare, or in the case of something like like uh, you know, Game of Thrones or or uh, whatever the super hot series is right now, a desire to be part of the public conversation mm -hmm. uh, about that show going on and being in the know. Yeah. Uh, the content doesn't, uh, you know, you can watch that now or you can watch it in three years. It'll still be great, but right. but some people are going to want that now. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. You know, it's interesting though. The the I think the the degree to which uh, the technology sector uh, sort of underestimates the importance of the ecosystem is is that can't, there's no ceiling to that, right? I mean, it's, it's um, when looking at, anybody who's looking at carriage distribution, I've been spending a lot of time doing that. Um, and you come up against the bundles and you say, God, I wish that we could unbundle this stuff. I wish we could be like Canada. I wish we could, you know, do this all very differently. Um, it's very easy from the technology perspective to look at that and say, well, that's a bad user experience. That's dumb. That's a poor choice, et cetera, et cetera. W w let's create a perfect marketplace that weeds all that stuff out. You mentioned iTunes, you know, some place that you could just get to the brand that you actually care about, which most people, frankly, do identify more with shows than, than channels at this point. Mm -hmm. However, the majority of those niche shows would absolutely disappear in a heartbeat without the tent pole, right, channel with the bundle. And I think that um, to get to that place, right, like to get to a place, I, look, every network I've met with, 
uh, gets it. These are, you know, and, and they know that we're going here, right? Problem is, is how do we get there? Well, we're showing up with like electric cars. They're GM, we've got the electric cars, right? Um, I think it's ultimately the hybrid that will, it is the Prius that will have gotten us yeah. to the, elect by, to the fully the electric car. <laughs> I think we need the Prius of television. GM and the electric car is the perfect analogy for this industry, by the right. way, right? It like. Well, actually, I mean, there are multiple things to comment on, but start with your first premise. Uh, I don't think consumers want to have 10 different business relationships to get their content. Um, I have enough trouble just keeping up with my phone bill and my electricity bill and my cable television bill, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do people really want to take one item in their life, their entertainment, mm -hmm. and actually uh, pay subscriptions and have sign-ins and passwords and everything yeah. like that to 10 different people? I think it's a lot of mileage in the old model where your cable TV company basically brings you your entertainment in a nice little yeah. package and they charge you a fortune. Then we go to the next point about bundling versus a la carte. Uh, the industry is still very much, particularly the majors in the United States, are very much built around bundling. They require it. Um, the only real reticence I've seen and heard from a number of places is uh, with the Disney Group's ESPN property, which actually uh, <laughs> substantially is a substantial proportion of basic cable rates today. I think what the number is of the order of $4 per subscriber month. Right. for ESPN, and you don't get a choice. You don't get anything else Disney, including ABC, et cetera, unless right. you put ESPN in the basic package. And that can represent as much as 25% of it. You know, the run, I would say the run-up to the Super Bowl is a bad time to be trashing sports Absolutely. programming. <laughs> but uh, it's funny, we, uh, I, I've, d I've had some, been a part of some consumer research that kind of confirmed that there's just a huge segment, particularly of connected users, mm -hmm. early adopters of OTT, et cetera. Yeah that don't want to buy sports at all. Yeah. Well, they've started to introduce, there are some packages that are sport free. Right. So, right. you know, yeah. th it's, it's, that's it the is. first sign, like to me, those people don't buy them, do they? It's, but they're out, uh, the point is that they're out there and it means that the, the, the guys have made new business models that make that work. So mm -hmm. that to me, it's more of the harbinger. It's not necessarily, yeah. this, is the, this is the model, it's more of the signs Let, that are out there. If, if I can just throw out something, Mike, to what, to what you said, yeah. and that is, you're right, I don't think people, want to uh, manage lots of different a la carte payments or subscriptions or, or, or what have you, but um, you're assuming that in an a la carte world, they have to do that. Right. And what if that's all behind a wall? Oh, no, and, exactly. And that can and be managed by, mm -hmm. by a, 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 an so interface, a UI, a single company. So let, let's, let's talk about it from the perspective of show creators and talk about what this world looks like. And, and I want to ease into this as we go to, you know, if you believe it's going to be on demand, it's a la carte, it's bundled. There are a lot more opportunities now to sell programming and sell content. Right. There are a lot more opportunities to go direct and make money. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are familiar with the Roku box, which is a small over-the-top box, about 50 bucks. Started out with Netflix. Um, I'm going to ask you guys and see if anybody else knows if they don't. Um, the number one channel on the Roku box, very clearly Netflix. <laughs> Who knows the number two? I think you told me this one. Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck. Yeah. And Glenn Beck wow. goes direct, <laughs> charges, how much does he charge a month? Oh, I don't know. It's like 20, five, no, it's five, like five hundred it's five, something. Five bucks area, a month. Yeah. So for all the people who love Glenn Beck, they've got this direct connection to Glenn. Yeah. Five bucks a month. Uh, they've added another bill. Um, but you know what happened to Glenn Beck when this happened? He was no longer part of the national discourse. He used to be on The Daily Show. I mean, ridiculed on The Daily Show, right? You know, every <laughs> yep. week. He hasn't been on The Daily Show since he went direct. Mm -hmm. So he's making more money, he's gone direct, but, but he's not part of the national conversation. Right. So um, there's a lot of, and I say that as a preface because there are different business models for lots of different things. There is a lot of money sloshing around in the online video mm -hmm. space, right? We're in Google theater, YouTube spending hundreds of billions or whatever, not that much, but um, mm -hmm. lots of money. <laughs> uh, Hulu is gonna spend 500 million to buy content. You guys are buying content at MSN, right? You're commissioning shows and buying things? Uh, more more uh, original productions. Right, that's what I mean, and original, right. Yeah. So YouTube is, do, uh, Yahoo is doing it, Netflix is doing it with uh, Arrested Development, a bunch of others. Lots of great new places. Is this sustainable, Mike? You, go ahead, jump in, Mike. Well, I mean, the, what I think um, IPTV, the whole over-the-top experience makes possible is an infinite channel capacity, right? Whereas the traditional cable operator in the United States has a limit of, I don't know, depending on their uh, infrastructure, their analog infrastructure from the 1950s or whatever they've replaced it with, they may be able to deliver 900 channels to you. 
um, because they're basically sending every single channel to that outlet in your wall, that uh, BNC connector. Um, with OTT, with IPTV, I'm only delivering to the house what's being requested by that house. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. using just the capacity necessary to deliver what's being requested. So that now sets an, a no maximum on the number of channels that I can deliver. So I think the opportunity actually exists for the content side to create channels that possibly have a highly distributed audience. I live in the state of Vermont. I have a number of friends who are Hispanic. And the only way they can get Spanish TV stations is by paying 20 bucks a month to the cable operator. And they get an international package that has about four Hispanic or Spanish-speaking stations along with Chinese, Japanese, Italian, French, et cetera. Um, if you come down to Florida or Arizona or California or Nevada, that's in the standard lineup. Mm -hmm. um, the point is that it's essentially not being served properly. Right. That's because uh, the cable operators made the decision is they don't want to waste one of their channel slots for Spanish television other than in a premium package. OTT, IPTV essentially means that you could get anything from anywhere, right? And the idea that a la carte might actually damage certain weaker channels or weaker properties is possibly true. I mean, it, can they really sustain, sustain Darwinian competition well, is really questionable. But the point is, if there's even a core space of 10,000 fans scattered across the planet, you could probably turn it into a channel or well, something you know, and, and make money. Speaking of some of these lower costs, I mean, Colin, you're a current. Do you think current survives in this world? Mm -hmm. Uh, from a distribution perspective or content just perspective? Just a channel perspective. I mean, does it, you know, does it I maintain its linear channel I, there was, position? There was, a, there was this commentator named uh, Keith Oberman. Yeah. O L G E O. It's two ends at the end, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I love Current. I, was, uh, I want to see them win and succeed. It's been disappointing to see that brand kind of disappear a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, there might be a consumer marketing question there, but there's also sort of a, a cable. Uh, I won't put you on the spot on that. Nico, you yeah. want to jump in on something? <laughs> I was just going to suggest to Mike that you uh, <coughs> buy your Spanish-speaking friends an Xbox. An Xbox? I, yeah. actually, <laughs> I have actually sold three Xboxes, so I would like my commission check any day right. now, please. <laughs> so, like, I'll, I'll see what I can do. So okay, thank you. I want to jump in on the, the Glenn Beck thing. It's interesting because they actually raised over six figures of, of paying subscribers in the first 30 days. So they knew the model worked in 30 days. That to me is the most interesting part of this, is the ability to experiment. Um, I don't know how much it costs to make TV shows other than apparently it's a lot. Um, more than making apps, <laughs> I know that much. <laughs> but I also know that, you know, with high, it's an it's not that much, it's actually really easy. Can they, what is the cancellation rate of new TV shows? 90 something percent, is that, am I right? It's in the 90s, right? And so you look at the costs involved to try something online, right? Mm -hmm. I was, I was kind of laughing at first, YouTube announced a $100 million initiative to create original programming. At first, my head went like this. I said, well, $100 million, that's, it's kind of like half a Michael Bay movie, right? <laughs> so what do you really get out of that, right? You, and then you kind of take, take the other twist and you say, well, maybe you get 50 shows, right? Or maybe you even get 100 mm -hmm. shows. I don't know. I mean, again, they're yeah, going yeah, to yeah, play around to get there. Yeah. But what, it, what I think IPTV really does is it brings the internet model of innovation and cost risk basis to the content world, which we've never had before. Mm -hmm. The content world before has always been huge endeavors to try things, and then maybe it works. I mean, you get a TV show now based on, a, on the Twitter, uh, the yeah. stuff my dad Stuff says. my dad didn't do too like, well, but. It didn't do well, but that, it couldn't, what if that had been tried as an online experiment first? Well, How much less money would look, it you, you guys bring up a lot of different uh, issues that I think are interesting. I mean, one is, you create a, you have a great idea for a television program, you create a pilot, you create, do you, do you go, put it out directly on YouTube or on some of these services? Do you go try and get it on a big network and build an audience and then take it direct, the Glenn Beck model? Uh, what's, the, what's the right model here? Do you come to Xbox and YouTube and Yahoo and is that the right way to go? Or do you go to the traditional uh, distributors of video? You know, I think you're getting to the marketing question, yep. right? Which is, which of these channels has any kind of marketing capacity and everything you just listed well the service itself is you know, intended to market that way and of course you know YouTube is a great example of um, <clears throat> they don't do a ton of consumer marketing and you know when I was when I was running video at Yahoo the number one question from every programmer was great how do I get my stuff on the home page yeah. well you got to get in line that's a tough yeah. one yeah. Um, so I think you know ultimately okay. what, what what's missing from the a la carte model obviously when it's that uh, disintermediated is where are you going to get your promos from, yeah. right? And here's, I'll just throw a little anecdote. Um, you know, one of the solutions that a lot of the programmers come to me with is, hey, we'll make you a national feed. 
right? We won't give you the you know affiliates. We'll give you the generic feed, right? right. It'll just have sort of the shows and then sort mm -hmm. of stuff in between. And you know, from my perspective, I said like I actually the thing there's two things wrong with that. It's missing promos. There's no local insertions at all, and it totally gives the the viewer the sense that I'm not watching something that the rest of the country is watching, yeah. right? And so you suddenly lose that sense of uh, it's kind of communication that you have with shared other people. Experience. It's a shared yeah, experience, yeah. It's weirdly. Uh, but there's no promotional inventory and there's no ability to promote other things. So you're not going to know if King, you know, Game but of Thrones is... But I think we're only a few years away from that becoming the zeitgeist. Uh, if you look at music and how much music... Forget the, well, the industry side of it, but how much it is fractured as a medium. You have... Yeah, you have the mainstream stuff, but other, other than the very tip of it, Music, I mean, I would guess that the five of us have radically different music tastes, and you go to the next five people, the next five people, and it's much harder to say, oh, well, he listens to indie rock. Like, that's not even a thing anymore, mm -hmm. right? So you have to assume that will happen to a TV. You have to assume we will move past the point where we all watch 30 Rock. Well, then who becomes well, the pitchfork of television? I think you're going to deal, you know, everybody looks back to the Cosby era numbers. I think you're going to see that get smaller. Yeah, uh, you well know, it is getting mm -hmm. smaller. The yeah. only TV is the only industry the internet tidal wave has not yet touched and come back from. I mean, every other industry that the internet hits, after it comes back, it's a different, smaller, more, not necessarily out of the but more well, individualized market. Yeah. Nico, go ahead. I, I, I wanted to pose a question to the, uh, to the audience. How, how many people uh, in here are content creators, content producers? Most of the people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I, I would just throw out a, a, a few points for, for, for you content creators. Um, just that I would urge you not to trust anything that any of us say. <laughs> um, Speak for yourself. He's, he's, <laughs> he, sounds, he sounds pretty knowledgeable. And, Maybe trust him. And, and, and I, think, I think the one big takeaway that, that, uh, that, that you can trust <laughs> is that that all of the old models are changing, um, and all of the new ones uh, have not been figured out yet, and they're all worth trying to to one extent or another. Um, from uh, you know starting starting as as simply as what do I create? Uh, do I create a uh, you know a 22 minute, 44 minute uh, show? Do I create a, a three minute short form clip? A lot of people ask me, um, a lot of content creators ask me, uh, how long should my piece of content be? What is the optimum length uh, for promotion on, on the internet? Um, which to me is, is uh, I mean, I understand the question, but it's a nutty one. Because your, your piece of content should be as long as your piece of content should be. Um, Too many notes? And, uh, and just, you know. It, as long as it keeps your audience captivated, um, that's what you should create for. And that's what this new sort of revolution gives you. It doesn't place you, know, box, place you in a box or, or guidelines around you. And uh, uh, you, you also need to optimize for where you think your audience is going to be consuming your content the most. Mm -hmm. um, uh, don't. I think if you create a generic piece and put it on on multiple platforms, it will be, you know, accepted and consumed as a generic piece on multiple platforms. But if you optimize it for where you think most people are gonna consume it on on a phone, on a, on an Xbox, on on an iPad, wh whatever, then uh, there'll be you know much greater engagement there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just I, I think there's so much opportunity in this new space, and and who the who the sort of power players are uh, is, is still, I, I would even say that Microsoft is not definitely one of those power players. I think we're a little better positioned than, it, than, than most to, to potentially take advantage of this revolution. But uh, there's so many, uh, so many examples online of, of you know, person with, with uh, crummy camera and laptop who have, have gone on to success not necessarily sustained success, which is what we're all trying to figure out, but they've all found a piece of that puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, and they've gone far with that one. So. Mike? Well, I mean, 
back to your comment about the length of the content, don't, don't we get back to the sit back experience versus the curl up experience? I don't know about you, but if I curl up for more than 25 minutes, I mean, my legs go numb, right? Well, uh, it depends on how you use it, and it depends on I me. Mean, watch the usage models. I think, you know, personally, this is going to become one of the dominant video consumption devices out there, mm -hmm. because if you look at it like this, it's like having that big screen up there on the wall. It's not a shared experience, um, but it can be used in many different ways. And I watch both my wife and my son. They, the big screen TV doesn't get used anymore. It's all about this. Mm -hmm. but, but you said it's not a social experience. I, I, uh, yes, it is. Well, it, it's not a, like, we're, we can't all sit down in one room and watch it. It's not a same space social experience. I think, that, I think the content yeah, is if, the... If the, if the same content is available both on the, your big screen and on that, it, it just depends on which piece of glass you're watching it on. Right, exactly. And what we see is our, our viewers tell us, it's like, best screen available. If I've got a big yep. screen, I'm going to watch it there. That's if it. I'm, if all I have is this and I want to watch Absolutely. it, if all I have my phone, I want to watch Epic Mealtime, I'll watch it there. Content, mm -hmm. I think the content is the currency of, of social conversations. Yep. Yep. And uh, uh, you know, whether you're sitting in a room with a bunch of people around you or, or if you're all consuming the same thing, you'll find ways to yep. talk about it. You'll find ways to engage. Jeremy? Epic Mealtime, I'm just curious. How many of the people in the room know what Epic Mealtime is? How many how people? Many, okay, how many people know what Epic Meal Time the show is? How many people like bacon? All of you raise your hand and said you like bacon and don't know Epic Meal Time. Go watch it. <laughs> uh, by the way, another quick audience poll: uh, How many of you, let's say monthly or more, watch a TED Talk? Cool. Okay, wow, that's pretty good. So, mm -hmm. and what? Why did you ask that? Uh, well, Epic Meal Time <laughs> to me is the example. Epic Meal Time is is a coming to very mainstream soon content. Um, it was niche, it's, it's, ra it's crazy. You have, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry, there's no way to describe Epic Meal Time other than to watch Epic Meal Time. It will only take three to six minutes of your, of your life. And it's to, to me, Epic Meal Time is when my kids eat all the vegetables on their plate and then clear the dishes <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> so look, that's pretty epic. We, we've uh, got, we've way, got my, my core yeah, go ahead, was, was, was that TED Talks are in the 20, 30, 40 million hours viewed already mm -hmm. and has hit the mainstream. So I was just kind of curious how this room broke down with that. Well, we, we have uh, about eight minutes left, so if you've got questions, uh, you can line up behind the microphones that are in the center of the room. Please do. Obviously, none of us have any of the answers, but we all have ideas about where it's going. My, and, yeah. my you know, apologies what, to the panel. No, 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 no look, <laughs> things have changed. Even in the last 12 months, I was having dinner with a couple guys last mm -hmm. night, we realized things have changed so much in 12 months since we were at NAPP a year ago where it's very clear that there is a lot of money being sloshed around in the digital world, whether it's YouTube or Netflix or Hulu or anybody else, there are huge opportunities out there. And I think uh, the fact that all of you have sat through all of this sort of you know, thought-provoking bloviation is great, because they're all trying to figure it out. So, question. Uh, you did address a couple of different things. One of them is the broadband and digital divide and all the people that don't even have high-speed broadband mm -hmm. or don't have mm -hmm. even a computer. And mm -hmm. From mm -hmm. what I understand, like 25% of the people in the United States don't have it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's, I'll, I'll yeah. jump right in. That's yeah. a huge question. It's a mm -hmm. huge issue because everything that I've been working, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, the target market, that's not what you just described, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So I think the OTT industry is largely oblivious. I think that's a safe statement, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and that's a really interesting question because content development for that other half mm -hmm. will continue. Right. Mm -hmm. But you look at things like Roku as perfect for that market. Roku is a $50 box. It's an you, yeah. you don't have a recurring fee to a cable company, and there's effectively infinite content you could consume. You just have to find it. It's you still need a broadband connection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a but good it's point, but it's, it's, it's what a, an, an end cap at Best Buy is powerful. Yeah. $50 yeah. product. Mm -hmm. yeah. You go from paying 80 to $200 a month cable right. fee, it's not an iPad. plus internet fee, yep. to just having one little box. And also from the content side, uh, do you really want to spend, or the major broadcasters, do they really want to spend maybe five million dollars for an hour episode, which is kind of what it costs, uh, for something that people are going to watch on an iPad or a phone? Why I, not? I, I think Game, Game of Thrones looks great yeah. on yep. this device. Does yeah. it? It does. Well, I watched every, se every episode on an airplane. That was my Game of Thrones experience. Okay. Although I, I watched them all on the big screen. My wife watched but, them all. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks it's a lot. It's been um, quite <coughs> eye-opening. <laughs> yes, sir.
I live in South America, and in order to access most IPTV services, I need to go through proxies and fake my IP address. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't make sense. The internet should be global. Mm -hmm. And it's also forcing me to go through pirated means like Webana because uh, I cannot get to the content legally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. When do you think we will get to that point where well, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll be global? I'd, I'd ask the people in this room. Well, I, I yeah. actually have a, yeah. a, a comment there, which is um, we would we would love to be able to provide you unfettered access to uh, all the content that that, it, that we make available in the United States. And we, where we have licensed content, we just, in most cases, haven't been able to secure global distribution rights. Right. Uh, I don't think that's going to change. And therefore, we focus much more on original content production, where we own all distribution mm. rights. And all that content is available to you, though uh, how relevant it is varies from from show to show, content genre to genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. I mean, it's it really has to do with the business practices and the requirements of the content providers, mm -hmm. programmers, etc. I spend a lot of time talking to programmers about how I'm going to stop you doing exactly what you described. You know, there are techniques for geo blocking, geolocating, and things like that. If I'm being told that uh, a particular show um, can only be shown in the United States. Pacific time zone at a certain time, and you're coming from South America, I'm putting stuff in my IPTV system that's basically going to try and find you and stop you and cut you off. Right? It's actually surprisingly easy to spot proxies if you put the right software and the right intelligence into the CDN. But uh, it is all down to uh, the requirements of the broadcasters. And I, I contended at a panel recently at CES that a lot of those practices are what drive piracy. Right? Does anybody know what the most pirated show in the world is? No, it's Jersey actually, Shore. It's actually top, top Gear from the BBC. They show it, let's say, on a Thursday night at 8 o'clock, and the next time anybody outside the United States, outside the UK, would get a chance to look at it, it's about seven months later. My sources tell me that within 30 minutes of the program ending in the UK, torrents have already completed, yeah. right? <laughs> so uh, the, it, it's exactly those types of practices, those syndication, the distribution rights, et cetera, et cetera, that are actually driving significant quantities of piracy. I think we all want to stop piracy. I'm not sure SOPA was the way to go or PIPR or whatever they call it. But um, you know, clearly, the, the practices and the technology are now getting out of step. Well, and I think you see that as technology has emerged, it, it in the end, what it enables is what you end up being able to do. I mean, the business models that created that artificial scarcity through windowing and other things are basically that the technology allows that to go away. And over time, I believe it will go mm. away. Technology. Sure as I've seen it, always ends up ruling the roost in the end. If you can do it, people figure out a way to do it, then we figure out business models to make money at it. Mm -hmm. And that happened in music, it happened in publishing, it's happening in a number of different ways. So I just, but uh, we're, we're in the middle of that, and uh, um, I don't know, so we have no more questions, we've got three minutes left, so I'm gonna turn that into a question for the panelists to wrap up. So thinking about this, direct, unbundled, IP delivered, uh, whether it's a la carte or it's show-based or whatever world, um, how long do you think we have before the business models change to the point where that is the dominant way that we get things? And you know, the answer can be never. It can be five years, two years, one year. I don't know. And uh, because I started from here, Mike, I'm going to start with you. How long? I don't know what the time scale is. I think it's longer than most of us technologists and people up here would like. Well, my feeling is that when it happens, it'll be an avalanche. Right? Mm -hmm. Basically, when one combine capitulates, they all will capitulate. Kind of like the move to ebooks that we've seen over the last year. I mean, who knew that we would all be reading on ebooks? I mean, I have an e-reader that I started using 12 years ago. Still have it, works great. But the dramatic shift to ebooks over the last 12 months, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's been much quicker, I think, than anybody predicted. Colin? Mm -hmm. It weighs 18 pounds, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it it's a Commodore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Colin? Jim's old school like that. I'd say, uh, <laughs> I'd say it's 10 to 15 years. And, um, and, uh, Specifically, anybody in the room who has done any carriage licensing um, knows that you can pretty easily draw a map of all the deals and when they expire and when they will be renewed. And um, that's, I mean, there's nothing, nothing is going to happen in the next five years that will be considered truly dramatic, that will totally break, you know, down to what we're a fully unbundled, fully a la carte world. Just, just won't happen. Ten years at best, if it does, 
it's not likely to look like a pure iTunes universe because that would put so yeah. many people out of work. It's that. not even funny. I don't believe that. And you guys I was in magazines that. and newspapers in the 90s, and they're all out of work. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Jeremy. Well, if this is press or exile, I just say one day, and then I get yeah. <laughs> That's right. right. Um, <laughs> That's the price is right, yeah. exactly. I think well played. Uh, a day and a minute. Yeah, I <laughs> you win the beer battle chair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're a little, I, I'm going to go a little more aggressive um, than, than Colin's prediction because I think I'm going to bifurcate the audience instead and say that you're mm -hmm. going to have this grandfathered audience that is going to stick to business as usual and watch business as usual, et cetera. And I think you're going to have a younger generation that realistically has spent their entire computerized life finding content for free. And so the industry at large has to solve that and fix that problem per the, per mm -hmm. the technology because um, as much as I am a technology first advocate, I also do not, I mean, people got to get paid. Uh, and I think that's an important thing uh, that the industry has to deal with and recognize. So I, I do believe that a younger generation is going to be much more comfortable relying on Facebook, a TV guide, and you know, streaming technology to just say, give me some stuff to watch, as opposed to the, it's Thursday, 8 p.m., therefore I will watch X. I believe mm -hmm. that event and appointment TV will radically drop. Nico? Yeah, pretty much what he said. <laughs> uh, I, I, mean, I mean, basically, uh, I think within five years, uh, the, the old models, <coughs> the old deals are still in place, and that's going to take a decade or more. Um, but uh, the, the, the way the landscape is right now, uh, everything is getting shaken up, and, and new models and, and new uh, methods of distribution and consumption are going to take over in the next five years. Mm -hmm. no, two more yeah. words. No, no, no. no. We're out of time. Apple. Out of time. Watch mm -hmm. Apple. Watch, and I will say, it just to close up, is that it's hard to change media consumption habits. Um, I, when I was in the magazine side, basically your readers die off, your magazine's dead. Look at Reader's Digest and some of the magazines I was at. So it's, it, what you hear from here is it is hard to change. So Jim Lauterbach, uh, moderator, thank you guys very much. Mike West, uh, Colin Decker, Jeremy Toman, Nico Tells. And if you like this topic and if it's of interest, there's tons of great stuff happening in this room over the next two days. I see Graham Bennett from YouTube is going to be on the, this stage on Wednesday. There's just a ton of great people in here who uh, have a lot of great insights. So make sure you... Uh, Keep coming back for more. Thank you, guys.